we've got 70 participants um so just we will start now um we're going to do this as a three-part presentation first of all i'm going to give you a bit of background on thomas hardy and his links with archaeology throughout his life um, and how that tied into his writing and his output Dave is then going to hand over to actually look at some of the objects that we still have in the museum's collection, which are currently on loan to Wiltshire Museum and go through those. And then I'll be passing over to Martin to talk about what we have found today in the present, current, non-Thomas Hardy era um, and what has been found looking through the paddock in the last week for the Festival of Archaeology dig. So, I will just share my screen. If anyone has trouble with sound at any point through the talk, if you could just put it into the chat and then we can um, get closer to the screen or whatever is appropriate um, to sort that out. Wonderful. So first of all, we've got this lovely photograph of Thomas Hardy standing next to what he calls his druidical stone. And this is our introduction um, leading into Thomas Hardy and his link with archaeology in the Dorchester area. First of all, I've got this picture of Monbury Ring by John Everett from 1924. And I, this is representing the fact that Thomas Hardy grew up in this ancient landscape surrounded by these monuments. Quite often these weren't seen as ancient monuments regarded for their heritage at the time. They, he was using them very much in an everyday sense. So Monbury Ring, he knew very well from having attended a free trade rally there when he was only four years old. And also um, from the anti-Catholic, anti-Popery riots that took place um, again when he was um, in about four or five years old. Interestingly, um, Mulberry Rings comes up in the news when it's the first uh, it's the first ain't scheduled monument to, well, to be scheduled monument to be saved from development by the railways. Uh, when the railways come to Dorchester, it's proposed to be demolished when they put in Dorchester South and West um, lines, and through public protest, it's saved. Unfortunately, many other monuments around the Dorchester area were not, and this is part of the impetus to finding the Dorset Natural History um, and Antiquarian Field Club, which collected many of the finds from these sites that were destroyed to later become what is now Dorset Museum. And so it is a site that Hardy would have known very, very well. And as he was growing up, he was also doing things like traveling around, along the Roman road between Puddletown and Higher Bockhampton, where he grew up with his mother, retracing the steps as he saw it of these Roman ghosts that had tramped up and down this walk. And this is something that becomes very important to him in his writing, this idea that we are treading through the landscape which our forebears have tr trodden before us. This was also very influenced by two characters in his life, um, Horace, so Hen Henry James Mole, just, um, so Henry Mole, who was vicar of Fordington at the time, and also father of one of Hardy's mentors, Horace Mole, and also his mentor, William Barnes. And they um, formed this initial group to preserve the heritage of the Dorset area. Their initial residence was in the Judge's Jeffrey's lodgings, um, and but they later on took their loves of uh, archaeology and heritage um, into creating what would become the Dorset County Museum in 1883. These young influencers, Common Hardy, we see him collecting bits um, from around his house, like this. A uh, bit of brick from the chimney at the Beacon Keeper's Hut on top of Rain Barrow, which you can see uh, even at this point, he's carefully curating and labelling the finds that he has in his collection. And he also became fascinated with not just the past as it littered the landscape, but also with the classical mythology um, that he was learning through his study of Latin and Greek and even a bit of Hebrew um, as a child at Isaac Last School up in Dorchester. And this love of classical literature stays with him for the rest of his life. These sketches I absolutely adore. They were done by Hardy to amuse his niece. Um, and you can see there the stories of the Spartans in various places of the Spartans, um, leaving their children on the hills, the Spartan kings, um, the, the reputed battle between the centaurs. And 
all of these little things he's trying to bring to life for this child and the way that he found them brought to life when he was a child, um, learning them and the way that his imagination peopled and brought them even more to life. So as I said, in 1883, we have Henry Joseph Mull, who was the brother of Horace Mull, Hardy's aforementioned men mentor. And he becomes the first curator of Dorset County Museum in 1883. And this is an institution which Hardy is heavily involved with himself um, and takes a, a very active interest in for the rest of his life. In 1883, Hardy was now living in Dorchester. He'd married Emma Gifford in 1874 and following their marriage, they moved around quite a bit. They were living for a time in London, in Wimborne, in Swanage, in Sturmets and Newton. But eventually they decide that they want to return to Dorchester where he'd spent his formative years. And so at this point, they're staying in Shire Hall Place um, up near the top of town, near the old court, uh, Crown Court in Dorchester. And so he's building Max Gate, designing Max Gate um, over in Fordington um, at exactly the same time that this museum is being formed in 1883. And it's an interesting thing when we talk about later the finds that were found when he was building Max Gate, um, because of course these go straight into that new museum building. So here is a picture of Max Gate in that very earliest phase. And you can see it looking remarkably new and crisp. Um, it's before Hardy had planted all of the trees up. So you can also see Conquer Barrow, which if we didn't have the trees on the housing estate now, we would also be seeing right framed perfectly by this window to our left. And Hardy was so taken by this ancient landscape, he thought about calling Maxgate Conquer House, um, just to try and tie it even closer into the landscape. But as it was, he settled on the idea of Maxgate, which referred to the maximum gate of um, the Roman settlement of Dinovaria, but also played on the idea of Mac, who kept the turnpike road, the toll gate at this point. So in that way, he was trying to use that name of the house, this very new house, to tie it into the land that it was built on. He was actually quite disappointed when he first arrived because he said the site felt very new, that sense that no one had built here before, no one had occupied it before. But as soon as they start digging the trenches, they find um, these little uh, burial pits and uh, lots of uh, ceramics. And he finds out that not only has it been occupied before, but it has been used by several different periods of history. And so here is a small sample of what he found uh, on his dig, which is currently in the museum, and we'll see more of when I hand over to David in a minute. At this time, he was also writing the Mayor of Casterbridge while, uh, while building this house. And again, that sense of anywhere you dig finding something comes through in this quote from the bit where he's talking about Monbury Rings. So Monbury Rings in his novels is called The Ring. He gives most places in the Wessex area a double name. And so the ring at Casterbridge was merely the local name of one of the finest Roman amphitheatres, if not the very finest remaining in Britain. Casterbridge announced old Rome in every street, alley and precinct. It looked Roman, bespoke the art of Rome, concealed the dead men of Rome. It was impossible to dig more than a foot or two deep about the town fields and gardens without coming upon some tall soldier or other of the empire who had lain there in his silent, unobtrusive rest for a space of 1500 years. He was mostly found lying on his side in an oval scoop in the chalk, like a chicken in its shell, his knees drawn up to his chest. So there you get very much a sense of Hardy, who maybe was feeling slightly exasperated by the fact that every time they dug a foundation trench, they found a skeleton or a bit of pot that needed to be um, excavated. But is also quite excited by this idea of a landscape that you literally can't dig more than two feet without finding something or other. And a few years later in 1890, they find uh, what Hardy later calls his Druid stone when they're cutting uh, holes in the garden for trenches um, for pipework and this later turned out to be part of the Neolithic um, enclosure yes, that's right. that um, Martin will be talking about later but of course Hardy at the time didn't really understand that wider heritage setting that he plonked himself in the middle of um, and so he puts it up and calls it his druidical stone 
a bit like you see earlier writers like William Stukeley doing about Stonehenge, imagining this Druid race that peopled the landscape before us. So it's quite an interesting case of Hardy taking something that is very archaeological and quite scientific and purposefully adding that layer of slightly antiquarian uh, mystique over it. He then, um, 1891, writes uh, Tesla d'Abervilles, which again is referring to these massive stone structures on Salisbury Plain, taking this ancient site and reimagining it in the present. What is its relevance to um, those of us living today? And in Tesla d'Abervilles, he presents it very much as this place of um, what he saw as had been sun worship, is almost kind of drawing this woman back to it. And she feels this kind of call to return to the stones as they're walking randomly across the plain. And the image he evokes as he describes this couple in the dark, stumbling across Salisbury Plain, coming across the stones, feeling their way in, listening to the hum of the wind going through these stones, and only really being able to perceive them by the absence of light rather than by actually being able to see them. They're just silhouetted against the sky. He brings this structure to life in such a strong way that when in 1899, they think Stonehenge is going to be deported to America, he is the one who is asked to write um, an article saying why it should be saved and why it is important for the nation. And so he writes this article, it's very moving, saying about how it's the hub of Wessex and in no way should it ever be allowed to leave this country. And not only that, but about the significance of its heritage setting in the wider sense, um, which I think is quite interesting today, knowing what we now know about the setting that he built Max Gaten. In 1908, um, excavations were started on Mornbury Rings. And this is a site which, of course, Hardy famously used in Mayor of Casterbridge in that um, episode we read earlier. And Hardy contributes a huge amount of money to this, uh, to this dig to make it possible. And it is this dig that makes them realise that not only was this a Roman amphitheatre, but actually it was also previously a Neolithic site. And they find these 45, 11 metre long deep trenches, um, so shafts. And so if you look at the picture on the left, you can see various men at different levels of the shaft. And then right at the very bottom, the face of the man deepest down in the shaft, poking his head up. I also love this one for it's the kind of far from the madding crowd meets um, kind of Indiana Jones photograph where you've got shepherd's huts all lined up with sheep hurdles to keep the public out. Um, and it, it, it does feel very much Thomas Hardy doing archaeology. And here are some further digs, uh, photos looking the other direction. Um, I particularly enjoyed the lady with their hats on, on the skyline. Um, and if anyone, um, any of you who know Dorchester will recognise the Eldridge Pope buildings uh, that you can see straight through that gap in Mornbury Rings before the police station had been built. Hardy uh, then employs his literary genius um, to, uh, to digest this for the public. And so we see him writing here about the moment when they find, oh sorry, um, they find that it isn't actually just a Roman, um, but potentially also Neolithic. And he talks about there was a moment when the blood of us onlookers ran cold and we shivered a shiver that was not occasioned by our wet feet and dripping clothes. And um, says that potentially, um, uh, but up thrown from one corner, prehistoric implements, flinted chips and horns and other remains. And a voice announced that the earthworks were of the Paleolithic or Neolithic age and not Roman at all. And at this point, there's sudden panic that um, what Hardy has written of as an amphitheater in Mayor of Casterbridge and what everyone has always taken to be Roman might actually be a Neolithic. And he goes on to say, thank God this was but a temporary moment, um, an unnecessary alarm, as they realize that there is also Roman remains there. And we now know uh, the site to be Neolithic originally with Roman adjustments and then the Civil War did a uh, period of further adjustments to turn it into a gun placement um, to defend the town. We've also got Bingham Barrow which was excavated in 1922 and this is where Hardy's poem The Class Skeletons comes from and 
a person at the time talks about the way that Hardy brings the site to life by describing not only what he sees in front of him, but imagining the other civilizations that people would be familiar with that were contemporaneous to this. So imagine, you know, was this um, coinciding with the time that Moses is alive? Um, who are the, in biblical history, was alive and contemporaneous with these sites? And so being able to bring together the known stories that people had from their biblical Christian upbringings and knowledge um, together with this new archaeological, um, very kind of earthy history and material culture that was coming in front of them. And then lastly, before I hand over to David, I just want to touch on the Fordington mosaic, which is an incredible mosaic, which Hardy got um, very closely involved with the preservation of. Um, but interestingly, it wasn't excavated until October 1927. And Hardy walked a mile in the rain at the age of 87 years old to go and see it because he was so excited by this new find that had been found so close to his house. And as you can see from the pictures here, you get a sense of the swells and the kind of interlocking decoration of this mosaic and um, it's then three months later that he finally passes away um, so it's very much a sense of one of the last things that he did um, was to go and see this mosaic and he was part of the committee deciding um, how it should be preserved and that committee and those decisions led to it now being preserved as one of the statement pieces in the atrium um, at Dorset Museum. Thank you very much. I will now pass over to David to um, show us some of the finds um, in the, not in the flesh quite, but as, as close as can be. Fantastic, thank you. Um, wh wh where I'm going to start is, um, if you can see that, which is um, the article he wrote in 1884 um, about the finds that he'd made at Max Gate. And this is some Romano British relics found at Max Gate, Dorchester read at the Dorchester Museum in 1884. Now, the interesting thing about that date is that it's two years, of course, before Mayor of Cranstonbridge, and we'll hear some echoes of that. So I'm just going to pick out a few, uh, just a few bits, because it's only four or five pages. Um, he talks about the, uh, the fight discovery of uh, some of the burials, and he says, each body was fitted with, one almost may almost say, perfect accuracy into the oval hole the crown of the head touching the maiden chalk at one end and the toes at the other, the tight fitting situation being strongly suggestive of the chicken in the eggshell. Which again, you know, you heard about that from Mayor of Casterbridge. And then I'll um, just change camera and you'll be able to see the finds that are in, in, uh, on display here at the museum. Just a reminder, so the Hardy exhibition is in four venues at the time. It's one exhibition, as Harriet knows, because she put it all together in four venues. So that's with Paul, Salisbury, and with us in Devizes at the Wiltshire Museum. And so our topic was the, um, is ancient Wessex and his interest in ancient Wessex. And so you see here the finds. Now in the foreground, um, I'll read you what he says. On the head of one of these skeletons, between the top of the forehead and the crown, rested a fibula or clasp of bronze and iron, the front having been apparently gilt. This is, I believe, a somewhat unusual position for this kind of fastening, which seemed to have sustained a fillet of the hair. And actually, as an archaeologist, this is quite fun because it's not one object, it's actually three. There are two sort of circular penannular brooches, as they're called, or annular brooches, really, and a classic, uh, almost safety pin, uh, Roman brooch. And you know, they were obviously placed on the body together and by the head. So this has been suggested that um, perhaps this was um, fastening a shroud or something like that. Um, and then the next, you see the urns, uh, the pots behind. What he says about those in, uh, were, were the, in the second burial, there were four urns standing nearly upright, two being of ordinary size, and you can see one of them, two quite small. They stood touching each other and close to the breast of the skeleton and saying how they were empty because there was some something of some description in, in uh, one of the pots in the other burials that you've just seen. And then the last thing, um, so I then want to touch on something that he says towards the end, which is that he's starting to think about 
what these finds that he talks about here and you've heard about from Mayor of Castlebridge say about uh, the town. And he says, it would be a worthy attempt to rehabilitate on paper the living Derno Varia of 14 or 1500 years ago, as it actually appeared to the eyes of the then Dorchester men and women under the rays of the same morning and evening sun, which rises and sets over it now. Wonderful evocation of people then were as they are now. What kind of object did Dorchester then form in the summer landscape? West of the large buildings, were they small? How did the roofs group themselves? What were the gardens like, if any? What social character had the streets? What were the customary noises? What sort of exterior was exhibited by this hybrid Romano-British people, apart from the soldiery? So, you know, fascinating that he was really thinking about what these finds would say about ordinary life. So I'm just changing my camera back. Get the wrong button. There we go. So I think this, this article is absolutely fascinating. It really does pick up some themes which he develops with Mayor of Casterbridge and he talks about also about uh, finds that are still being unearthed daily by our local Schliemann, of course the chap who excavated at Troy. So I think with that it really sort of sets the scene for the, um, the archaeological discoveries that have happened since and I think at this point perhaps we pass, pass back to you Harriet and you can introduce our third speaker. Yes, so um, we've got Martin Papworth here, who is the National Trust archaeologist who has been excavating the site um, for the last week, really. Um, um, so I'll just get up um, the slides and we're going to have a look at what uh, has been found on the site since and what is its significance beyond Thomas Hardy's initial archaeological interest. And so uh, just... Share the screen here. So I start the, the hello everybody. It's nice to speak to you. Um, I guess we ought to start by talking about the uh, the mayor of Casterbridge, as we've all talked about it in our various talks. And uh, the archaeologist amongst you may spot that Roman burials don't tend to be crouched in an oval shallow grave. Um, the chicken and the egg situation is what he's describing about the things he finds. And of course, he's talking about Romano-British people. This is a Jura-Trigon style burial. This is very much a South Dorset sort of burial that he's finding at Max Gate. And so uh, if he's got a fibula there and those brooches, it may be these are, these are just at the transition from native people becoming Roman, but they're not Roman soldiers. So, uh, but uh, that's the thing, isn't it? That's what we're talking about today. He found things in his garden, which were not fully understood at the time. And we were all standing on each other's shoulders, learning a little bit more each generation. And uh, this week we learned a little bit more. And a hundred years after Thomas Hardy in the 1980s, I'll be talking a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, Roland Smith, who's listening, was very much involved with the Dorchester bypass work. But I start with a picture of Monday morning and marking out the trench with white paint uh, and the JCB standing by. So a careful archaeological excavation, but forgive us because that digging was, I knew was, would take away the plough soil because before Thomas Hardy worked on his house, his land had been part of the open fields of Dorchester for hundreds of years and the land had been ploughed many, many times. And in the small test pits I'd done before this, I'd found that the ground was very churned up right down to the chalk. So we saved ourselves a lot of bother by starting off with a big JCB. But I better set it in some context. Now I put it to you that Dorset, Dorchester it's probably one of the best, if not the best, archaeological landscape in the country. Um, we're looking now at some of the uh, other places that have Neolithic Bronze Age ceremonial landscapes, places like Stonehenge with its, its cursus. You've got uh, White Sheet Hill in the Stourhead Estate, which has 
a nice grouping of ceremonial monuments. And then, of course, crossing the border into Dorset, the huge Dorset Cursus and a group of ceremonial enclosures at Knowlton, uh, which very much like the ridge where Max Gate sits, is another grouping with barrows all along the hilltop. And of course, Dorchester has more barrows than anywhere in a cluster. Um, so um, with, 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 with the great post circle under Waitrose and Mount Pleasant, Mornby rings we've already heard about, and flagstones, which it lies under uh, Max Gate, uh, we've got a lot to say that actually the county town, um, which is still the county town, has significance going back many thousands of years. And look at this, just to give you my first job um, after I graduated was to visit every single barrow on the South Dorset Ridgeway. So I'm, I'm not new to this landscape at all. And every black dot there is a burial mound. So I, I, I put it to you. <laughs> it's a very significant landscape overlooking Dorset and to walk the Ridgeway is a fabulous thing. Um, and of course, even Maiden Castle, the, the, most, the most impressive hill fort probably in the country has a long bank barrow underneath it. So yes, all the different types of barrows there. There are, the past is all around us at Dorset, in Dorset and particularly in the Dorset land, Dorchester landscape. So here is a reminder that you can see um, in the bottom of the, these two pictures, um, the Roman walls of Dorchester, and that's sort of straight, slightly um, rectangular, um, bent rectangular figure. And then the circle is the great post circle underneath Waitrose that was found just a few years ago uh, in the 1980s. So huge ring of enormous posts, um, so much work going on there, which puts us in context. So as I say, we've seen Mount Pleasant with Con Conquer Barrow on top of it. Um, and just to the west of that, lies the area which the, um, the road went through in 18, 1987 and 1988. And here, after a geophysical survey in 1982 that indicated there was something there, uh, extensive archaeological excavations took place by Wessex archaeology, who identified this ring of, of uh, pits. They all have little causeways. It's not a continuous circle, but it is circular uh, if they're linked together. And uh, it dates, it's a middle Neolithic enclosure. So it's not a causeway enclosure, which is early Neolithic, that's 3600 BC. And it's not a henge, which is late Neolithic, which is about 2600, 2400 BC. This is middle Neolithic, so it's about 3000 BC. And it's contemporary with the earthwork around Stonehenge. So very significant. Um, and uh, it was swept away by the road, but very well excavated before that many phases here. Some of the earliest pottery anywhere is found underneath this henge, so it was significant even before the, this, um, this enclosure was built. Um, and what you must note with this is that Max Gate is off to the right of that enclosure. The paddock, the little piece, little field to the top of it, um, that is also National Trust. So if you follow that circle around, the whole of that area is actually um, owned by the National Trust and is highly significant as all that's left of it. It becomes more significant that when we look in the, the book, the Daughters to Bypass book that was published in 1997, some of those ditches, um, with those, 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 those linking ditches, actually had artwork in them. So on the bare chalk face cut vertically for the ditch are these sort of scratch marks engraved in patterns. Some of them look like hill forts, some look like um, long before hill forts, but they, they, we don't know the understanding, but it's rare to get art of this period, so it's quite exciting. Um, so, knowing all this, it makes not only Max Gate as Hardy's place, Thomas Hardy as the, um, as an interest, with his interest in archaeology and what Harriet told us so well about what he found in his grounds when he built his house and laid out his garden, but also um, the archaeology that is all that's preserved there after the road scheme went in. If you look to the left of my resistivity meter, 
center stage there with the house behind, there's another stone. That's one of the stones that was found in the 1987. So, um, so not only has his own stone, which is in the next garden over, here's a stone 100 years on found when this enclosure was discovered. So our geophysical survey hasn't been very good. It's shown bits of garden stuff, there's blobs there. Um, so that's that front garden survey, but really number seven you see highlighted there um, is crossed by a, one of his garden gravel paths. <laughs> but seven might be something, you know, there are blobs um, of potential archeology. span um, And this is the magnetometer survey which is quite hard to do a magnetometer survey because there's so many different little areas of open ground in the actual um, property because there's so many garden detail and design there. Um, didn't really show up much, a few water pipes and things. Um, we also did a ground probing radar survey um, under the position of the paddock. And what you see as a green dotted line there is, uh, is supposed to be the, where the enclosure ought to go. So. It's a circle, um, you can plot the circle around. And this week for Festival of Archaeology, we've got a series of stumps that Michelle has put out to show where the, this circular line should go uh, across um, the paddock and the garden. Um, but certainly ground probing radar didn't show the continuation of that circle. So yeah, this is, this is looking at the picture again. We had um, Peter Bellamy and Mike Trevathan um, did a watching brief on a gas pipe that needs to be dug, oh no, a sewer trench, sorry, a service trench that went from Mapsgate across to the paddock. And that found archeology span right the way across it. Um, so um, we know that it's from all these bits of evidence, we're building up a picture of a very intensively um, archeological um, intercutting period from middle Neolithic right the way through to the um, to the to the uh, to the Roman period, um, and we found two Roman graves just in that small cutting there. These three little red marks, if you see the just above where the words paddock is, these were done in a magnetometry survey in 1992, where they were trying to then to trace the continuation of this circle, um, and they found very faintly four blobs that could be these pits. Also note from this picture that the area in green that was was excavated in 1987, it becomes lot, lot less um, as you head towards the boundary of the paddock. Um, so does that mean that it's fading out there? Here's the, um, here's the excavation showing all the graves and the various ditches and things. So you can see an um, extraordinary amount of archaeology going on. So there's a section showing some of the, the things were found in that, that sewage trench. Um, he's just scraping the tops of these graves, some of Thomas Hardy's Roman soldiers. And some of the grave fittings found there. So all these things, we, there was potential of finding. So 2016, I put in, there was an idea, it's very hard having enough parking in the area for visitors to Max Gate. So I put in, there was an idea that possibly the paddock might be a place to put a car park. So I dug three little trenches there to see how far down the, the chalk and the archeology span was um, that might lie beneath the plow soil. So I did three trenches and found that down to chalk, there was nothing but disturbed plow soil. So um, it was until you got to the natural chalk, there was nothing of very much archaeological significance. And there we are, that's the stuff that's coming out of that plough soil. So you get prehistoric flint, quite a modern nail, slate. We actually found bricks with TH on from, uh, from the Hardy bricks, Hardy's bricks that he built, his, his brother built the house from, his father built the house from. So, so yeah, lots of different stuff. Uh, yeah, this is this picture again. To the left, there should be a picture of our conservation management plan. So um, we were looking at that. Um, and uh, this shows you once again the, posi the position of Flagstone's enclosure, which is written there on this screen, to the right, Mount Pleasant. 
and to this great pit circle I told you about is that circle just to the right of Dorchester. Then you have Mornby Rings. You have a cluster, all those barrows that even come down off the ridgeway. There's Maiden Castle, Poundbury, the other hill fort. Loads going on. So, surely, when we started, here's our big trench, we're going to clean it up. Because in our conservation management plan, we realised Hardy was highly significant. Of course, he built the house. The whole reason we got the site as a national trust, as a, as an, as a, a, a place to, of pilgrimage of those of literature who, who loved Hardy's works. Um, it's also a place where he interacted with archaeology. And I hope I've bigged up the picture that actually archaeologically it is highly significant. So one of the actions that came out of this was to make it a scheduled monument. So I applied to Historic England and say this is a highly significant site. Mount Pleasant is a scheduled monument. Monby Rings is a scheduled monument. A lot of Dorchester is a scheduled monument. So therefore it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You can see how the circular the boundary comes around. And they said to us, actually, I don't think your geophysical survey has proved that it's a scheduled monument um, because you haven't found it. So it seemed a good idea with all that I've said to you before that we could open up a big area in the paddock, um, which is just scrubby grassland and look beneath, peel off a window, lift the lid. We know it's plough soil and see what lies beneath this area as the, as the circle comes round. This surely should intercut with a line of pits of the Middle Neolithic period. So here we are, there's a gap. Mm. So um, yeah, but also the other thing, yeah. So here is um, the other thing we were going to do at the same time. This is Hardy's front door at Max Gate. We also wanted to know what sort of drive surface that Hardy would have had. We've got a whole series. The archaeology of tarmac surfaces is what we found. Um, and all with their own bedding of, of hardcore. Um, but we did come down onto this rather nice um, round um, lime and brick and, and sand surface, which sits at the bottom. You see that you've got the flight, the step down. And because of these tarmac surfaces being brought back up again, it's at a much higher level now. So lower down is what the original surface he would have stood on would have been. And there it is. So we have found that surface, which is nice. Um, uh, so perhaps we'll try and recreate something like that. You can see how high the ground is surface. We've got the bottom of the step there, just to the right of the plastic pipe. So we've got some good stratigraphy of, of cuttings through different surfaces there. So anyway, here's, here's the surfaces coming up. We've got our marquee behind. We're going to sieve the, uh, the surface we take off. So we're having lots of children coming along and anybody else wants to, to sieve the soil we take off and see what finds they can make in it. And this is the kind of stuff we're finding. We're finding square nails. We've got 17th century pottery. We've got Verwood pottery, all sorts of bits of flint and, and uh, struck flake, tobacco pipe stems. And here is us we're looking out with all our illustrations, talking to people about what has been found, the megaliths that sat in the pits, and the hope that we would find similar megaliths and similar pits in our trench. Here we are going back in a row, cleaning back and finding um, chalk, lots of chalk. <laughs> um, so we, we're not, we're not, it is not as dense as, I think all the other evidence indicated we had lots of archaeology here, but much of what we found has been chalk. But if you look to the right, there's an upturned barrow. And if you see there's a dark soil there and a, and a ring shape edging to the chalk there. So here we've actually found a feature and here it is. This is what we're looking for. Things cutting into the chalk. This looks like a large pit. It's over two meters in diameter. And off to one side, you can see there's a post pit. That's about 30 to 40 centimeters across. So what we have found here, we found quite a lot of, of just the very bottoms of features that over hundreds of years of plowing has that been scoured away 
by the plough, but the deeper features like this pit still survive. So yesterday we were quite concerned because we big the site up as I've tried to for you during this talk and we'd um, invited Digging for Britain who so much liked the connection of Thomas Hardy uh, with uh, with archaeology and with the this great enclosure that should cross our land that uh, Alice Roberts came out with the Digging for Britain team and we talked through all the kinds of themes that we've been talking about this evening and they were not they, they found it wonderful they're very exciting and um, so um, you'll see that in January next year what, what they made of it all and, and how they edited it. So here we are, we've got, we've got the, uh, the pit in the distance. We can see these to the left now, you can see diagonal um, cuttings along the edge, just the very bottoms of features turning, turning across the site. So tomorrow we're going to have um, a photogrammetric survey done showing all of the changes in surface um, and be a 3D survey of this chalk floor. Right, top bottom right was finished today. Another pit has been found over there and we haven't quite completed it. Tomorrow morning, we hope to take the last of the soil off. So we're back in front of the house. We imagined Thomas Hardy coming out of the door and saying, so what have you found? <laughs> well, well, Thomas, we found a great deal, but just as all seemed to be going, going completely wrong, we were reminded that actually our ring of pits runs right in front of that front door. And one of our pits, one of our little meter square trenches coincides with where that ring of pits should be. Um, it just clips the island of the drive as it comes across. And, uh, and, and there we had the site of a, of, a, of a ditch, a pit. And today we have dug into it. I haven't got any photographs. If I'd got in earlier, I'd have put it onto the edge. That is actually, we're having a struck flint out of there, and it's exactly what you might expect from one of the 1987, 1988 hits. So, uh, and, uh, and we've extended the trench and made it a bit wider and a bit longer, and uh, we're going to finish it off tomorrow. Now, what we're hoping for, and sometimes it does happen, just as this small trench actually coincided brilliantly with this circuit, it may happen that we will find a bit of antler pick or something which will give us a radiocarbon date for this feature. And if that comes back as 3000 BC, we're pleased. we'll be very pleased indeed. <laughs> so we'll have something to tell, uh, tell, the, to tell, the, tell Thomas Hardy's ghost. So here we are. Um, and, and this is the last photograph, which just shows you what it looked like excavating in 1988, uh, when those pits were dug, ringing round there, Bottom right is the paddock. If you imagine where our big trench is, that coincides just to the right of those compass tea bears, or that, uh, that little area, I can't point to it, but um, yeah. Yeah, can you see that down there? Oh yes, there. So our trench is there. Thanks, Harriet. Just about, just about there, that's it. So we did coincide with that line, as you can see from this aerial photograph. But actually, the thing we found was that, which is also on the line. So that's the story. That's how far we got. You can never predict anything in archaeology, but I hope that's been of interest to you. Thank you so much, Martin. It's been really interesting um, to see how it's all progressed and also to, I think, just to understand so much more about how this site fits within the wider heritage landscape and like you say all of the different sites that we just walk across when we go across Waitrose Car Park and um, and look at from afar and don't necessarily join up all the dots of how yeah. they coincided. It's precious isn't it? I mean mm -hmm. everything in the landscape speaks, it's all a layer of time and if you're an archaeologist or you're interested in that side of things everything has a story um, and this and Thomas Hardy and Max Gate is a very good example of that. You know. Wonderful. Um, so do we have any questions? I can see two things in the chat I'm just going to open up quickly. Um, so we had a question um, just going right back. Someone said about there was someone reading at the photograph um, at the front door of the photograph of Max Gate looking towards Conquer Barrow. And yes, indeed, there was. It is Thomas Hardy sitting in his stovepipe hat. Um, 
posing for the camera, which I think is quite interesting as well, that that is one of uh, the few pictures we have from that period surviving. And yet he so purposefully made sure that he was posing so that the camera took in not only his brand new house and him posing there, but also Conquer Barrow to establish it within its archeological setting. And we also had another question about the two annular brooches, um, which David has answered in the chat. Um, and I don't know if Martin, you want to say any more yeah, about so that? You don't usually see that. A fibula is just being found on its own, which gives a face safety pin on its own that held a cloak. So uh, I think it's fascinating because you're getting this transition because when the Romans came, of course, the local people became Romanized, but they were still Jurotrigan, they were still late Iron Age people. And a lot of their customs carried on. They were still using Jurotrigan coins into the second century, it creeps into the second century. So those crouch graves carried on in use into the Roman period and gradually faded out and became extended burials. So there, that, that arrangement, I think, is, is, a, is a crossover of the Roman and the, and the Iron Age. Yeah, I, I love that he was, um, I think he was quite impressed by, proud of himself for having found one on the forehead where he said they were normally found on around oh, the yes. neck. Yeah. Um, and Hardy kind of logs that. So that's my little kind of feeling proud of Hardy for logging something unusual in an archaeological situation. Um, and he later said that he, he had always wanted to see a ghost and someone pointed out to him that after stealing all of this jewellery off of whichever poor skeleton it was in his garden, if he hadn't been haunted by now, then there surely couldn't be such a thing as ghosts. <laughs> Make of that as you will. Um, we've got another comment from Victoria saying, uh, really looking forward to visiting um, tomorrow. And just to re-highlight that, Martin um, and Michelle, uh, if you want to come and visit tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be going on. It's still going on. And we, if you visit tomorrow, you may see what our front door trench reveals. So you may find the answer then. And then we've got a comment. Um, have you had discussions with the archaeologists working on the adjoining paddock to see if there are links with what is being found in that whole area? Yes, we have. Yes. In fact, I spoke to Mike Trevathan, who worked in the neighbouring field, and a number of ditches are heading towards us. Uh, what we found may be the very bottom of some of those features. They're little V-shaped ditches, and they're, they're having finding scraps of late Roman pottery and the odd Roman coin. And that kind of finds assemblage is very much to do with the sub-Roman period. So after Britain comes out of the empire, it's that Romanized culture of the fifth, sixth, seventh century. So that's the kind of signature of those ditches. Um, so we, you can actually get through the fence and have a look. So I did that. <laughs> Uh, next one, could you explain where Conquer Barrow is? Is it the two mounds you can see on the hill? No, they are other barrows. No, the, I think if those are the ones you make notes, it's, um, it's east, isn't it? It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's beyond yeah. the housing state now. Yes, it's, yeah, there's it's a big, it's big enclosure called Mount Pleasant and it sits on the bank of Mount Pleasant. So it's early Bronze Age on top of late Neolithic. Um, so it's uh, how many metres, about 100, 200 metres away from Max Gate, through, across the housing estate. It's, it's now heavily wooded, isn't it? Yes, you, yes, it's not as visible as it was in that photograph now, but it's still there. And... Oh, thank you. That's um, an encouraging one from Roland Smith saying, it'd be so good to establish authoritatively that the flagstone monument is or is not a precise circle. Keep investigating. Oh, thanks, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> really nice galvanising one there. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Um, so uh, does anyone else have any... Oh, I've got questions and answers here. If there were to be an entrance to the enclosure and if it was on a similar access to the entrance to Monby Rings, might that put it in the paddock to explain why you've got this random empty space? Oh, yes. That's a nice one. Yeah, that would be good. Who knows? <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, say, say, I think, what, 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 which direction is Monby Rings facing? Is that east? It's quite, I mean, there's a thing about round, I mean, brown, it's quite often the case you get, get, East facing things because that's the sunrise, isn't it? So you get a lot of round houses, we have all have east entrances because you wake you up in the morning when the sun rises. So anyway, I'm just waffling, I don't know. 
I don't know, it might so, be. Something for our further investigation. Yes. Uh, where are all of the inscribed chalk carvings found in the original excavations prior to the bypass? Well, Roland might be able to tell us, I think they're still there. I don't think they were taken out. I think they were photographed in situ and left. But well, I- Roland, if you're still with us and want to put an answer in the chat to that, we'd be really intrigued. <laughs> Um, and then we've also got Ruth saying, will we be able to get a recorded version of this webinar as I completely lost visual at 6pm? Mm. Um, I understand that we have got recording in progress uh, that uh, David has started at the beginning. And so this will be available online afterwards. We uh, tend to leave a bit of a gap um, after we've broadcast it before we put it online. Um, but we will be sending out... Um, I think we can send out the link to all the participants when it is up online. And then the last one, the sarsen resurrected at Max Gate. Uh, where in the 80s did that come from? Was it in the central burial? No, it wasn't. No, I, as far as I can remember, it came from one of the pit circles. Each, each of the sarsen, there were a number of sarsens found. The biggest one was here, and it is now here, I think. But each of them's overlay a burial of some sort. There are several of them overlay a burial. Um, so it was one of the stones that went over a, a burial in that pit circle. So who knows that we, uh, it, you know, all the sarsens were found in a buried in a pit. They weren't um, they weren't erect. Thank you very much. If there's anyone who has any other questions, um, apart from that, I just want to remind people Sorry. again that we have our talk happening. Uh, next Thursday on war writing in Hardy, looking at war poetry of the Crimea Boer and First World Wars, uh, which is live at Max Gate, and also it's happening online, and, and that's the 4th of August, the Thursday, um, at 7 o'clock in the evening, uh, so you can still get the links for that online. David, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, just to say, uh, Ro uh, Roland um, and, uh, where are we? Uh, Robert come back to say that the chalk carvings are in store at Dorset Museum and Roland had said they were removed with difficulty conserved are in the Dorset County Museum well, worth seeing and, ah, and so the last question from Tessa sorry I didn't see that one about how many days are we open to visitors during the dig the dig finishes tomorrow but the trench will be left open over the weekend um, are you going to carry on sitting over the weekend you are. So there will still be activities for children or anybody else who wants to sip our topsoil. And then it'll be backfilled on Monday. So thank you very much. If anyone has any more questions, put them in quickly. But other than that, um, we will be drawing this to a close. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been really lovely to um, have you all join us and to be able to share this moment with you um, as we've concluding our week of archaeology. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.